Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar, How to Use Apricot Software to Improve Data Quality. Appreciate your attendance today and your interest in today's topic. I'm also appreciative of your interest in making the most of your Apricot system. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jeff Hegwood. I'm an Apricot Software Consultant at Sidekick Solutions. Sidekick Solutions is an independent software consulting firm. We specialize in Apricot software. We help new and existing Apricot users set up, streamline, and make the most of their Apricot software with a range of professional services, including implementation, reporting, consulting, data migration, and also database audits and cleanup. I've been working with Apricot software for about four years with nonprofits collaboratives, and public sector organizations, varied size and scope, and I'm excited to share some of what we've learned today. Hopefully you can implement some of these best practices in your own Apricot system. Since we're on a remote webinar here, a little geographical context, I'm presenting today from Spokane, Washington, which is where I live and work, right on the border of Idaho and Washington State. We at Sidekick Solutions, we're a remote team, and we serve clients from across the U.S., so remote meetings are no stranger to us. We're excited to have attendees from across the U.S. We also have a few international attendees as well. Again, thank you all for joining. We appreciate it. We have a lot to cover today, so let's take a quick look at our agenda. During this webinar, we're going to review causes of poor data quality, discuss how we can assess potential challenges and identify them, outline how to clean up existing data, and then offer some ideas on how to save time as a database administrator with data quality automation. At the end of the presentation, we will wrap up with some key takeaways and questions. My goal with this presentation is to spark ideas that might apply to your Apricot system. Now, some of these ideas may be a fit, some of them may not. We're gonna cover a lot of ground in this presentation, but I do want the concepts to stick. So to help with that, you're gonna receive an email uh, following this webinar with a recorded video of today's presentation and a link to the slides. In addition, we're going to open up the conversation at the end of the presentation for questions, which can cover any apricot related topic. All right, let's dive in. So why are we here? Why manage data quality at all? That seems like maybe a silly question, but given that data quality management takes time and effort to do and to implement well, it's worth framing data quality with a why. So number one, we want to improve data quality in Apricot to improve the consistency and accuracy of our reports. All of us rely on accurate reports in some way, whether that's compliance with a funder, curiosity about our own data and program performance, or some other reason, and we need accurate data in order to make decisions. Number two, clean data reduces the risk of major data cleanups that often have high costs or even unexpected costs. And number three, we can save time with data quality systems and automation um, in our day-to-day. -day. So the good news is that Apricot comes with a number of features and tools that can help you to manage data quality so the task isn't a complete drain on your day-to-day -day workload. Managing data quality shouldn't be an all-consuming task. In most cases, if we set up the right systems, and Apricot has a number of those systems built in and standard, Apricot can do a lot of the heavy lifting. But before we dive into solutions, it's important to identify what are some potential gaps in data quality that you might be experiencing and how do we, how do we correct them. So you may be feeling some of these in your own Apricot. If you are, they could indicate a potential data quality challenge. Things like not trusting your data, tracking data in other systems. This is for all my Excel users out there, you know who you are. 
inaccurate reports, or you may not be able to report at all in your apricot system. Now, there are certainly plenty of other symptoms, um, but for the most part, those get bucketed into two main causes in apricot. The first being an inadequate database structure, that's your forms and links, and number two, incomplete data entry. So there are some things to look out for when defining the root cause of data quality challenges in each of these two areas. So the first, for inadequate database structure, we're looking for things like a collection of forms with no workflow. This might be evidenced by users jumping around the database to complete many forms with no set flow or process. In addition, you might also find that you have insufficient linking between unassociated forms, which creates a lack of reporting depth. There's a primary link between Tier 1 and Tier 2 forms in Apricot. Beyond that, records and forms are separate from each other. Linking associates those forms together so that we can correlate them in reports. Not having links can create some gaps in your ability to report on data, which can lead to exporting to Excel, doing manipulation in other systems, so on and so forth. Inadequate database structure might also be found in incorrect field choices, something like having a text field where a dropdown should be available instead. Um, I've seen databases with uh, fields, text fields used quite liberally, and we want to try and make data as objective as possible for reporting. The final is that maybe we're unable to report using Apricot's standard features. Maybe you need to use other tools, or maybe you need to be using um, custom SQL in a heavy capacity uh, beyond just feature capabilities. But most of your reporting can and should be done in Apricot. Um, an inability to generate reports is often a combination of lack of capacity in reporting in, in how to actually design and run a report in Apricot, which could be a training issue. Um, but beyond that, it can also be a former link design issue. Second, if we're looking at incomplete data entry, we might look for things like records saved but missing important fields. This might be available, or you might find this data quality gap if requirements on fields aren't or can't be set, and there are situations where that occurs. In addition, you might find where workflow steps are incomplete. So an example might be someone who has an intake and a profile, but an enrollment form was never created for the program. Or an ISP was created, but there are no associated goals. You might also find that records are lost or slip through the cracks. So something like an ISP being open, yet the person or the client being exited from the program on their enrollment. Or you may find that someone has exited the program, but no post assessment was completed. In addition, this might be evidenced by no standard rules or conventions for data entry. If users aren't working from a set of principles, or that'd be a minimum, a set of principles for data entry, or even rules at a maximum. If those aren't in place, that could cause incomplete data entry as well. So narr narrowing down your data quality challenges into these two buckets will help you to identify solutions and next steps because the solutions for inadequate database structure or incomplete data entry will be quite different. So with all this, you might be wondering, where do I start? How do I even begin to address data quality challenges? It may feel like a daunting task, um, and data quality challenges can um, be quite extensive in some cases. The key here is, is to know that every data quality assessment is a little different, and it depends on your database structure, especially that app, given that Apricot can be customized. So to start, we need a process, 
and we need to apply it to any situation. It needs to be broad enough that we can apply it to whatever unique scenario you're running into in your own apricot. So I'd encourage you to try this three-step process, assess, clean up, and manage. So step one is to assess causes of poor data quality. We've talked about some of those. Step two is to set a baseline, which means clean up existing data or abandon it altogether. And then step three is to manage data quality with systems and automation. Once we have a baseline, we need to continually manage that data quality so that it remains uh, intact. So let's talk about each of these steps um, in order. So step one, assess. There are three ways to assess data quality in Apricot, and you can use one or many of these solutions to identify potential gaps. In fact, these are solutions that we use with our own clients um, to assess potential gaps in data quality or um, issues with database structure. No matter the format you use, there will be a common set of steps to assess issues with data quality. Um, we recommend that you start by taking inventory of some areas or some things that are flagging for your attention. Step two is to define a vision. Once you have the inventory and vision laid out, you can compare those two together to find gaps and then develop a corrective action plan. So let's talk through these three methods here, workflow, report, and user feedback. So the workflow assessment method says, let's look through our data entry step by step. And as we go through that process, thinking as a user, operating as a user, let's attempt to identify potential gaps. What could we stumble on as a user as we go through the process of data entry? Does the system keep us in the bumpers? or is there broad flexibility to enter data in various ways? Take inventory, that's your step one. The second is a report requirements method, and this is where we would list the records and fields that must be accurate in order to generate our required reports. If you have a funder report for a grant, if you have a quarterly report that you need to give to your board, or you have a report that you need to analyze the performance of your program, what's required to develop those reports? What data do we need? Take inventory of that, and you can identify where you need to confirm data quality in order to generate accurate reports. And then the final one is the user feedback method. This one's a little bit more loose. Basically, gather feedback from your users. Uh, ask them where they see potential gaps and then assess each area uh, and potential extensions from that area. Again, we're starting with by taking an inventory with identification and then going through a similar process to assess how we address each data quality scenario. Then we're gonna clean up. We're gonna clean up the existing data, we're gonna abandon it altogether. So the goal here is to set a baseline level of data quality. So this might involve form and link redesign, restructuring the way your forms or the links between those forms are arranged. This might also include manual record modifications if things can't be done in batch. And this might also include bulk updates or data migrations using the import tool. So let's Make a quick note on the import tool and bulk updates for data migrations. So the import tool is really an administrator's best friend in managing data quality in Apricot. Whether you're importing batches from another source or updating existing data in Apricot, as a database administrator, you're gonna use the import tool quite a bit. One of the critical skills that every Apricot database administrator needs to know how to do is to update existing data using a record ID duplicate check. This is a common tactic for migrating some or all of the data on a form. So if you don't have the import tool already, we highly recommend activating it for your database. And although we're not gonna cover how to do a duplicate check, a record ID duplicate check update import today, I do recommend adding that to your list of things to learn because it may come up in a few areas. 
For example, let's say that you want to update a field to a new field type. Let's say your gender field is a dropdown and you want to make it a radio button. You will need to use this importing procedure using the record ID as a perfect duplicate check to migrate the data from the dropdown to the radio button. Another scenario, let's say that you want to update the value in a dropdown. So let's say one of your values is misspelled and you want to update that. You cannot simply go into the form and update the value manually. That data will not push through to all of your existing records. You must export the data, modify it in Excel, and re-import it back into Apricot. It's critical that you don't attempt to overwrite values in a drop-down checkbox radio button or any other set value field without doing an import. You must do an import to update those values. You might also migrate data to a new form and abandon an old form, or you want to create links between records that were recently or pre previously unassociated. So this idea of bulk updating with the import tool comes up quite a bit. Um, and it's something that we do with our clients all the time. And if you're a database administrator, you should expect to be doing the same. So let's get to the fun part. And this is how do we manage data quality with systems? So this st step helps you maintain data quality in Apricot because the right systems can save time and ensure accurate reporting. There's three types of data quality systems that we can implement in Apricot. So the first is form-based, second is report-based, and the third is user-based. And each one of these has different solutions, and we're going to go through a couple of them here today. The primary focus of these three solutions is to automate the user experience so that users complete the right forms, and enter the right data and take the appropriate steps in your program or service workflow. We want to try and take as much off the administrator's plate and put as much on the technology as we can to simplify your day-to-day -day workload. So let's go through each of these. Let's start with form-based solutions. So there are a number of form-based solutions and all of these are located in the gear icon at the top of each form on the administrator tab. So there's things like hiding a form from the menu, that's a tier one option. Or you can hide a tier two in the document folder. We can also set record limits or allow copies depending on how you'd like to manage records um, in the database. A Couple of notes on each of these. So we're going to do a quick demo on the hiding component of this. But record limit is actually one that should be used more frequently. There are some specific scenarios where you might use the record limit. A recent example, we had a client that needed to restrict access to a client's health information. So instead of placing it on the client profile as a tier one, we made a health profile as a tier two. And since every client should only ever have one health profile, we limited the record to one. Now this is very important because if you add more than one health profile, there's a possibility in reports that you will duplicate that client. So this is a data quality control that we can set up to, to limit the number of rows that show up in a report per client when we only need a certain number of records to be added. So let's talk about the hiding component. So hiding is, is kind of a, a, a trick, if you will. Um, we're forcing users to go through specific workflows to enter their data, which narrows their choices. So for example, I don't need users entering partner agencies. Partner agencies are linked to a referral, which is under my client profile. I also have it in a couple of other locations, but I have an external referral here and it's linked. But I don't need my users creating partner agencies, I just need them creating external referrals. 
So I'm going to hide the partner agency tier one search altogether. And I can do that from the administrator tab by simply going to the form, clicking the gear icon, and then selecting hide from navigation menu. When I apply and publish this, It's no longer accessible as a primary navigation element. It's located under this More button. Now, I can also do this with permission sets by removing the ability to search. That's also an option. Um, but this is a clean way to just hide it from users. Another scenario would be to hide a form from the document folder. So in this particular case, I have an ISP, and then goals are linked to an ISP and created with a wizard link from the ISP record itself. You can see here I have a wizard link to the goal so that everything can be done from this ISP. I can track goals um, and all of the data that I need about this ISP on one form without navigating the way, simplifying the workflow for my users. But since I have a wizard link here, I don't want users to enter goals outside of that structure because in so doing, I'm not linking these goals to an ISP and that's not what I want. That's bad data quality. I need every goal link to an ISP. So what I can do is I can hide the goal from the document folder. hide from document folder. And when I publish this form, goal is no longer located in the document folder and is only accessible through the ISP. Great, now we're forcing users through a specific pathway. I did get a question here, what does ISP stand for? In this case, it's an individual service plan. Other organizations might have IEPs for education. Um, these might also be just generic plans, uh, program plans or service plans by client. And these are generally used to aggregate things like qualitative goals or achievement of specific domains, outcomes, or indicators. So another form-based solution are field properties. So there's the standard ones. We can require fields or we can set them as a duplicate check. But there are others like clear on copy or locking auto-populate fields. I ran into an example with a client recently where users were copying tier two records and forgetting to update uh, certain fields in the new record. And there's a good lesson and good reminder that clear on copy should be used whenever we are allowing copies of a tier two record and we should set the form to, or the field, excuse me, to clear on copy in all situations where that field should be updated by users. And that's simply do done by checking the box in the field properties. Another data quality control is to lock auto populate fields. So on the form where a link exists, you may have an auto populate field and that auto populate field might pull data from another place in Apricot. Generally speaking, you don't need users to edit the auto populate fields. They might be there for reference or they might be there for easy access. If they need to be edited, certainly keep them unlocked, but the majority of the time they should be locked because they don't need to be edited. This is important if you're using those auto populate fields in your reports. So an example of this might be if I'm linking an external referral to a partner agency, 
I might auto populate the name of the partner agency and maybe their type, what type of service they offer. We do this to simplify reporting, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, but if we have the data on the form, the referral form itself, we can use that data in reports and ignore the linking field to the partner agency. But if we're going to do that, we do not want users modifying the data in those fields. We can also set link requirements. We can set things like same folder linking, association limits. We can automate workflows with wizard linkings. Or we can lock and hide target links. So let's go through each of these. There's a lot to unpack here. So the first one is same folder linking. If you are linking two records together within the document folder, it's important to use same folder linking. So for example, if I'm creating an external referral, Well, that might be a bad example. Um, I have, I believe on the ISP, a link to the program enrollment, yes. So I am selecting only those enrollments that are related to this client. That's what we mean by same folder linking. So I'm saying when I create an individual service plan, I only want to link to records that are in this client's document folder. I don't wanna search all clients, all document folders. If you set to all clients and all document folders, there's a possibility that users will select the wrong record. And in so doing, you're relating unassociated clients together, uh, which creates a data quality problem. You can also set association limits. An example, um, working with a client that had families and needed to track parents. We set the association limits to two as a maximum so that we can only ever associate two parents to a family. This makes sense. Generally, there's either one or two parents in a family, so I can make that limit so there are never three, four, five, or more parents in a family. These association limits come into play because they dictate how many rows we might see in a report. We talked about wizard links earlier with goals. You can automate your workflows with wizard links. And then you may want to lock or hide target links. And here's what I mean by that. So let's say we have a client profile and a family profile. These two are obviously linked together. A client profile is linked to a family profile here. But let's say that I only want my users to associate clients to families through the client profile. I don't want them doing the same thing through the family profile because if they're doing it through another location, there's a possibility that they might make an error or link too many or too few. So I want to remove the ability for this person to add new clients to this family. You can see I can add clients here as I want. To do that, you might just say, well, I'm going to lock the target side of this link. So I'm just going to go to the family profile, and I'm simply going to lock, lock this field. So it's only a reference on the family profile. So now I can only make the link from the client profile. I'm forcing users through a standard point of data entry, thus minimizing my potential for issues with data quality. You can see I can still add here. I no longer have the ability to add from the family profile. You can see that this is locked. You can also set up email triggers. Email triggers are great for real-time record audits. If there's an important record that users will be filling out and it's something that you need to review to confirm that it's accurate. Send an email trigger when that record is created. So you can review it end to end. Essentially do a real time data quality check. You can also use this mechanism for approvals and reviews. So before things go through a next step, they have to be confirmed by a user or reviewed by a user. 
And you can also use email triggers to identify the completion of a workflow. So let's say you need to go back and review all of the steps in the workflow. You could simply send an email trigger to, to, have, to remind yourself to go do that. And last but not least, and maybe one of the most important is form logic. Form logic is dynamic validation of your data. You can use form logic to restrict the way that data is entered in your database so that you don't need to review the data in reports or at a later date. You can do things like unhide fields and then require them. This is actually a nice pairing of form logic actions. If a field is hidden, but a condition unhides it, you might go ahead and require the next field, the field that has been unhidden, so that it's always complete. There are also new options like set value and use lookup list, and you can even lock fields after certain conditions are met. Form logic can take some time to set up depending on the number of rules, conditions, and actions within those rules. But once it's set up, it does the work for you, which is why it's so important. So let's take a look at report-based solutions. So the first, and maybe the one that's most accessible, is a record audit. We can build a report looking at records created in a date range, add all of the fields to the form as columns, and either review the data in total in Apricot or export it to Excel for review. This is a brute force style of data quality assessment, but again, it's a very easy data quality mechanism to set up and it requires you to review each record row by row. This is what we might call a record audit. Moving beyond a record audit, we can also set up conditional validation reports. I like to call these trigger reports. The idea of a conditional report is that the report should be blank which means if the report is blank, none of the issues that are conditionally being found are evident in our database. So the report dynamically updates over time, identifying issues in the data. Once we correct them, they fall out of the report. So some things that you might use in this regard are things like missing links, more records than allowed, inactive client with activity. We talked about the idea of having an ISP open where the enrollment was closed, or any situation where form logic, there might be a gap where you can't constrain the data to a particular setting. So let's take a look at what these might look like. This is actually one of the best ways to automate your data quality is to use conditional validation. So I've created a report in Apricot. That analyzes the relationship between a client and a family. So I have a linking relationship between these two and I want to ensure that clients and families are entered appropriately. So I've created a, a quite a lengthy report with a number of scenarios that might be data quality pitfalls. So this might be clients without a linked family. Every client needs a family. Clients without a family role. So you'll notice on my client profile, every family member has a role, primary or member. I can select from this drop down here. So I'm looking for everyone that doesn't have one. Family profiles where the primary member name is mismatched. On the family profile, there's a name here. 
does that name match the primary selected here? Interestingly enough, this one does not. We're going to get to that in a bit. Families with more than one primary family member, we only ever want one, so we want to find scenarios where there are more than one. Families with no primary family member, and then unenrolled clients with active ISPs. This is that um, inactive with activity. So we have activities running, but the client is inactive. So let's go through each of these. Again, the goal is to confirm that this report is blank. The whole report should be blank, and that indicates clean data for these scenarios. So in this case, clients without a linked family profile. I can simply click the record. Link to a family. Refresh my report, and that person no longer shows up. Clients in a family without a role. I can simply select one of my clients, update their role. And that record will fall out of my report. Family profiles where the primary member name is mismatched. So I'll go ahead and open up my family profile. I can see that my primary is test tester, not tester test. So when I save that and I refresh my report, you can see that that record falls out. Families with more than one primary family member. See, here's a record here. You can simply open up one of these family profiles. Oh, excuse me, this is a client profile. Switch one of them to member, and they will fall out. So on and so forth. And the, the list goes on and on of conditional reports that you might be able to create. They're nearly unlimited. Let me take one more example because I've mentioned a couple times unenrolled clients with active ISPs. So if I open this up, I go to the folder. You can see that there is an exit date associated with this enrollment, but I do have an ISP that is open without a service plan closed. As soon as I close that, that person will fall out of the report. So conditional data quality reports trigger the next step in the process. They tell you what you need to do in order to clean up your data. This takes a lot of the thinking out of the process and automates your data quality tasks. So the final report-based solution is a strategic report. So some kind of programmatic or service-based report that you might run to analyze program or service performance. This is program-focused, and you're basically asking the question, is the output that we're seeing expected? You could use um, a tool like the three whys. Why does such and such look this way? Give an answer. Well, why is that answer the way it is? and then ask why again until you determine some kind of root cause or understanding of the data. What I like about strategic reports is that it gives a little bit more intuition. Um, you know about your programmatic outputs and it gives a little bit more user ownership. So you can put these types of questions to end users, uh, staff that are operating in your programs and services and see what they think about the numbers. If Sally had 50 cases last month, and in normal months she has 20, then you know that something's inaccurate about your data. Maybe Sally was selected too many times as an, ins an assignment for a particular client or group of clients. So 
So after report-based solutions, there are also user-based solutions. How can we support users to enter data accurately? So with user guides, we do recommend user guides. Apricot's a custom database and your solution may not have documentation in Apricot's knowledge base. Great way to deal with this is to just host user guides in a bulletin with a button. Um, so for example, I have a linked Google Doc with one of my user guides. You can also set up permission sets and record level access restrictions on users to narrow their focus on just those forms, links, and records to which they need access. Philosophically, you may decide to allow more access than less, which is a, a decision I certainly agree with. But permission sets and record level access restrictions are one way to narrow a user's focus. Um, so the capacity or capability of entering poor data uh, is limited. Training is also another area where you can support users. Our recommendation for end users, this is separate than administrators, is to train on use cases, specific workflows for data entry, and standard Apricot navigation, things like tier one search, how to navigate to the document folder, how to navigate to the edit tier one record so on and so forth. When you pair use cases with standard navigation skills, that usually gets users and users up to speed. When you pair though that training with user guides, uh, the stickiness of that knowledge and the processes that you run in Apricot uh, gets even greater. You can also set up a ticketing system to support end users. Your Apricot database is infinitely flexible. You can create forms for just about anything. And one of the ways that we've begun to support end users in implementations where user counts might get above 50, maybe above 30, is to allow some kind of ticketing system for users to submit report requests, questions, bugs that they find, and aggregate all of those in reports. So in this case, I have a bulletin on the home screen with all of my open tickets related to my database. This is something that you can set up with email triggers and communication pathways. So every step in the process of a support ticket internally for you and your group of users is automated. And then lastly, you can assign data quality to users. The most effective way that we've found to manage data quality is to set up conditional validation reports and provide access to those reports to the end users entering data. This gives them an opportunity to correct any errors that they are making. And also at the same time as they're making those corrections, learn how to do things properly and make adjustments. This allows for self-management and again, takes more of the workload off of the database administrator and puts more of the effort on the end user and the person who's doing the data entry to start with. So data quality is an expansive topic covers various domains, but it's the foundation of your database and a key contributor to the accuracy of your reports. So with all the content that we presented today, the solutions, the challenges, the ways that you assess data quality, we hope that you're able to take away a couple of things. And if we had to pick three, these would be our top three. 
Number one is that the import tool and form logic are recommended features for data quality management. Number two is that we recommend building management systems that automate the day-to-day -day task of data quality management where possible. And then lastly, where you have an opportunity to distribute responsibility for data quality to your end users. This is generally done with trigger reports or conditional validation reports that we talked about earlier. So thank you for attending today's session. We hope that you'll take these concepts and ideas with you and implement them in your own system. That concludes today's presentation. Before we open it up for questions, uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation and our approach to Apricot, let's find some time to connect. We'd love to learn more about your organization and your Apricot database and see if working together in a consulting engagement might be a good fit. Our door is always open and we hope that you'll keep us in mind the next time you have questions about Apricot. Thank you for attending today. Uh, we appreciate your interest and certainly your time. So let's go ahead and open up for questions. So I have a question here about unassociated forms. So I talked about linking a number of times throughout this presentation because it's a key component to Apricot database design. Forms can be associated or unassociated. And when I say association, I mean that out of the box, based on their construction, they are associated. So for example, a client profile to a program enrollment, tier one to tier two, parent to child, is an associated record. However, an individual service plan to a program enrollment and exit, while associated through the client profile, are not associated to each other. So this would be an unassociated tier two to tier two link. Another association might be between two tier ones. Let's say that we are linking uh, partner agencies to clients. Maybe they were referred and we want to track the referral. These two tier ones are basically separate databases in and of themselves. They have no correlation whatsoever. So in reports, we can't combine them together. Creating a linking between these two creates an unassociated tier one to tier one link. Hopefully that helps clarify a little bit about associated and unassociated forms. Out of the box, the only links that are created among forms are parent to child, tier one to tier two relationships. Everything beyond that, any other correlation or combination or link needs to be created as a field option on your form. And that's what gives your reports density and structure. Are there any other questions today before we wrap up? Feel free to add questions to the questions panel in your GoToWebinar toolbar, and I will be happy to answer them. If we are unable to get to any questions today, uh, we will certainly take those offline. You'll be getting an email after today's presentation with a recording of the video, as well as the slides, and I'd be happy to take any replies uh, comments or feedback from there. So I don't see any additional questions, so we will go ahead and close out for today. Feel free to contact us uh, via our email that we will be sending, and we'll be happy to connect. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.